you know Pavlov's dogs. A bell rings, a dog salivates. This is a classic example of behaviorism. When a bell rings, the dogs get fed, and over repetition, this turns into the dogs drooling the minute that they hear a bell. They don't even wait for the food anymore, they just hear that bell and they start drooling. I don't know about you, but that's how I feel every time I hear popcorn popping. Everyone has a trigger like that. You hear something, you smell something, you see something, and it makes you think of something else because you're conditioned to have that response. So today, let's dive into behaviorism. I'll talk about the basics, give you the essentials, and then we'll focus specifically on its use as a learning theory. So in learning, behaviorism is described as a permanent change in observable behavior, okay? All we care about is a behavior that can be observed. Think about yourself as a researcher, you're observing the subject. We only care about what they are doing. We don't care about what they are thinking. In fact, the mind is a black box. We don't care what goes on there. We can't see what goes on there. We only care about what the behavior is, okay? So it's inputs that cause a behavior and the output is the behavior. That's all that matters in behaviorism. And all around, behaviorists study only what can be measured and observed. These researchers posit that all behavior is actually just learned habits. And if behavior is learned, all behaviors can be unlearned or replaced by new behaviors. So if a observer deems a behavior is unacceptable, it can be replaced by an acceptable one. Bear with me here. All right, so here's how behaviors see the learning process. There's an environmental stimuli. It goes into the person, it affects the person, and then the output is a behavior. What's going on in that person's head? Don't care, this is behaviorism. We only care about inputs and outputs. And this process is called conditioning, okay? When there's a stimulus that causes a behavior and there's different kinds of conditioning we'll talk about in just a moment. Now, the theorists for this, of course, we can think of Pavlov and his dogs. He really laid out the principles of classical conditioning, which is a stimulus leading to a behavior. Um, Edward Thorndike did a really nice job describing what happens when you have a stimulus and a behavior. He was the first to say, hey, let's put this on paper. When you have something like a stimulus, it can result in a behavior. It's a law of effect. And he started kind of thinking about how this might apply to learning. Now, uh, John B. Watson was more of the founder of behaviorism in the United States. He did not care what happened in the mind. B.F. Skinner followed him. B.F. Skinner developed operant conditioning and that concept of the black box. He really built on what Watson did. There's a long storied history of behaviorists that did a lot of questionable things, yet some of what they taught us and some of what they learned can be very useful in the field of teaching and learning. But first, let's talk about classical and operant conditioning. So that's the two kinds of conditioning. We already talked about Pavlov being classical conditioning. There's a learning that happens through a stimulus association, okay? Um, those dogs drool whenever they hear a bell, that's classical. Operant is learning through consequences. So in classical, the stimulus comes before the behavior. In operant, the stimulus comes after the behavior. That leads us to reinforcement, which is a kind of stimulus. Now, there's two kinds of reinforcement, positive and negative. Same thing for punishment. There's positive and negative. But positive and negative doesn't necessarily mean good or bad. Positive is just adding something to increase a behavior. Negative is taking something away to increase a behavior. That might sound a little bit counterintuitive. So positive, negative, not necessarily good or bad. Here's some examples. A positive reinforcement, this is found to be one of the most effective ways of changing behaviors in humans. If you have, say, kids that have below average reading scores at a school and 
You pay them to read. This actually happened. Someone did a study on this. These students were paid $2 every time they read a book, and then they had to pass a short quiz about the book. That was wildly successful. These kids got better at reading. They got really into it because they had that positive reinforcement. Now, I'm not saying whether or not they loved reading, but they loved getting money every time they did read, okay? So they did get better at reading. Their feelings about it, I don't know. Again, behaviors don't care so much what's going on in the mind but the goal was met, the reading comprehension was increased because they received a positive reinforcement of money for reading. Now, in contrast, negative reinforcement is taking something away to increase a behavior. So say, in the United States, you want people to wear their seat belts when they are in a car. Now, if you've been in a car and you haven't had your seatbelt on, you're probably familiar with that beep, 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 and you go, oh my gosh, and you buckle in your seatbelt to get rid of that noise. That's an example of negative reinforcement. You get that noise to stop, you wear your seatbelt. So your, your behavior of wearing a seatbelt is increasing because that noise is taken away. Does that make sense? So there's this annoying noise if you don't wear the seatbelt, so you wear the seatbelt to get rid of the noise. That's an example of negative reinforcement, which is increasing the behavior of wearing a seatbelt. And you're more likely to buckle up in the future, right? For me, it's automatic. All right. There's also punishment in behaviorism. I'm not going to go deep into that. But I really liked this table uh, to give you more of a visual of how these things all relate to each other. I've got a link in the show notes with the source I got this from. It's an open textbook that you can use for free. All right, so you've got positive, you've got negative, you've got reinforcement, reinforcement, and you've got punishment. As we just talked about, reinforcement is something added to increase or removed to increase. But in both instances, positive or negative, we are increasing the likelihood of a behavior. In contrast, punishment is used to decrease behaviors, okay? So reinforcement increases, punishment decreases behavior. Positive punishment, something is added to decrease the behavior. Negative punishment, something is removed to decrease the likelihood of a behavior. Let's give you some examples. So think of a child that is texting in class. This kid's got a phone. They won't get off their phone in the classroom. The instructor might yell at them, might scold them and say, you know, I've been telling you and telling you, you need to get rid of the phone. That's an example of a positive punishment. The yelling is something that is added as a consequence for that behavior. And the goal is to decrease the use of the phone. So the teacher is thinking if I scold them, they will use that phone less. Does that work? Eh, maybe, maybe not. But that's the goal in any case. Uh, an example of a negative punishment, say, my kid is ramming me with his truck. He just has this truck. He thinks it's so funny when he rams me with it. A negative punishment is me taking the truck away so that I can decrease him, <laughs> his, his behavior of ramming me with that truck. Will it result in tears? Will we both be sad? Maybe, but that's the behaviorist example of how that would work. Now, if you want to use this in learning, let's talk about it. Now, of course, behaviorism as a general psychological concept is used a lot in K through 12 to shape children's behavior. This is a cultural thing. We don't care what happens so much in kids' heads. We just want them to do the thing. Is that good or bad? It is what it is. Um, as the example I gave you, learning to read is a good example of behaviorism being applied to increase reading comprehension. Uh, when I was a kid, if you read a certain number of books, you got a free pizza from Pizza Hut. I got a lot of free pizzas from Pizza Hut, let me tell you. I do love to read. <laughs> but again, behaviorism isn't about feelings. It doesn't care what happens in the head. It's, its only goal is to increase or decrease a behavior. So for kids, getting them to read more, read better, you can use positive reinforcement and that will be a big help for you. For adults, of course, it can have its uses too. My mind goes straight to safety training on the job. Say you're in a, a construction environment, lots of heavy equipment, lots of things happening. You need to use your personal protective equipment, right? You should be wearing a reflective vest. You should be wearing your helmet. You should be wearing your protective goggles. And maybe 
the negative punishment here is that you lose your job if you don't use these things. Okay, maybe get a series of warnings. And then finally, the negative punishment is, you know what, you can't use this stuff, it's not safe, you can't work here anymore. That's a good example of a negative punishment. Um, so that's a good example too of behaviorism in action in say a learning module. We don't care so much if what's going on in someone's mind about reflective vests or helmets, whether they think they look dorky or not, People just need to wear them because it's the safe thing to do. We don't care about your feelings. We just need you to do it. That's a good example of behaviorism for adults in a corporate or construction setting. Now, for both age groups, I do think behaviorism has a place in learning as far as instructional strategies go. Say you're learning a new concept, a new subject. Behaviorism can be really helpful for learning the basics of that subject, like terms and definitions, or for the basic concepts. Because a lot of the time a subject doesn't get interesting until you get into like the higher levels where you can really apply things. And when you're first getting into something, it can be a little bit tedious. So behaviorism can help with that. I'll talk about that in just a moment. And I just want to point out, since I'm an instructional designer, learning objectives are a great example of behaviorism. We aren't able to observe what's happening in someone's mind, right? And it's not that we don't care what's happening in their mind, but I, I can't see what's happening in your mind. You can't see what's happening in my mind. I can only see what you are able to do. So when I write a learning outcome or a learning objective, I'm describing something you should be able to do following a learning experience. And that is technically an example of behaviorism, though it may be I'm asking you to do something really creative, really analytical that really shows what's going on in your mind. Let's just think about that. All right, finally, let's talk about some instructional strategies. As I mentioned, I think this is a useful concept for teaching, say, terms and definitions, things that might be kind of tedious. Uh, maybe if you're getting into coding and you have to learn the syntax or the different uh, words that you can use. Be going really deep into drilling on this can be really useful. Um, gamification can be really useful. I think gamification is basically a form of behaviorism, right? You have fun, you're playing. If you die, that's a that's a negative punishment. <laughs> Positive reinforcement is you get more loot boxes. Negative is you get killed in the game. Um, good example of behaviorism there. You can use behaviorism to teach things as well, like terms and definitions. Um, having a really structured curriculum is something that is kind of behaviorist just because it's kind of helping people level up and starting them with the basics and shaping their behavior so they know that and they can move on to the next thing. Any sort of assessment based on performance would be a kind of behaviorist principle as well because we want to see what you can do. We don't care so much necessarily about what's going on in your mind. Again, problem is you can't read minds. It's probably for the best. Now, behaviorism used in learning has a lot of strengths and limitations. You know, it can be a strength that it's very objective, really focusing on what's measurable. If we're really looking at uh, skill acquisition, it can help to think in a behaviorist way. You know, we're, we're chunking, we're scaffolding, we're just helping you level up so you can do the next big thing. That said, limitations are that it does ignore thinking and creativity, depending. We're just not thinking so much about that in behaviorism. Um, it does completely disregard internal motivation, though you do have to be motivated by reinforcement or a punishment for that to change your behavior. But if you're really looking for, you know, say kids to love reading, paying them to read may not be the best way to build that intrinsic motivation. Finally, behaviorism has a lasting legacy, whether you feel like it has its uses or maybe you don't. Understanding it can still be really helpful for understanding how education works, how it's set up in our cultural expectations, and it can have some use as far as, you know, classroom management and instruction as well. I see behaviorism as being just one tool in my toolbox I can see how some of its principles, like for lower level learning, can be very useful, but I'm going to turn to other theories like, say, cognitivism or constructivism if I'm looking to really develop a person and their mind. I'm Lindsay, and I cover instructional design, e-learning development, and all things online teaching and learning.